I don't wish to engage with people who've made their mind up. Uh, maybe that's it. I want to. I want to engage with people in a way that that says let's let's learn from each other, um, whether it's family members or coworkers or you know somebody I run into at the grocery store. Unfortunately, when people on the street hear the word argument, what comes to mind are the gladiators that are waging war against one another on CNN and Fox News. Can and I just say something been. real quickly, Brooke? And the last point to this, Keith, I didn't interrupt you. I'm not Very attacking clear. anyone for being disabled. You're missing the point. I'm sorry. And Bill Clinton's not running I understand office. exactly the point that you're making. Answer the question. question. And the people who witness those arguments are seeing essentially a battle of people who don't care if the other person is persuaded, rather they're trying to impose upon their audience a particular point of view. Nine no, no million I, fewer. Yeah, I'm no, no one's saying that that is not the case, but remember when President... There are issues of power and privilege in terms of which arguments are considered to be the serious central ones. But what I always want to see is different points of view given airtime. An academic word that I think people should know, and that word is hegemony. It means the, the rule of kings. And our media is controlled by people at the top, people who have power. Both of those things are connected to whether your voice is being heard, um, whether it's being considered within the field of argumentation. We've lost the art of argument. People think about argument as, I have to prove a point. And if I'm right, it means that someone else is wrong. It happened because Alice didn't have all the facts. And of course, there's always someone late for an 8 o'clock class. Why not take a look at these incredibly funny books? I wonder though, are they too set against you because you're different? If only you'll meet them halfway, so they'll really get to know you. some arguments out there that really are crazy and that we don't have to take seriously. And if someone comes and says, I think the European Union is run by aliens and is a whole plot to, to set the landscape for domination of all humans, I have a bunch of reasons why I don't need to take that seriously. But then there are arguments that I may not agree with, uh, but which are not totally crazy. So you can have someone who says that, that the European Union is very strongly dominated by big business and almost everything that happens in the European Union traces to the clear interests of some big businesses. And big business does have quite a bit of influence in the European Union. And the basic position, even a strong version of it, can't be dismissed as crazy right at the beginning. If you have a very tight, non-crazy space, you're basically saying, I already know everything there is to know about this, and there's only one possible position. There's no point in having an argument. We need to try to push back the space of crazy, that line of the arguments that we're just not going to deal with, and enlarge in the space of non-crazy. Because it's the non-crazy space where we can learn and persuade people of something. Argumentation itself is so elemental to practically every field that you're going to engage in. This is one of the more important subjects you could possibly focus on in college. I think it's one of the more important subjects you could focus on as a human being because it helps us negotiate. I'd love to be just seen as a student, but I'll always be seen as a black student. Because when they talk about diversity, they talk about black history, they look upon me for, for the explanation or like the experience. But in ASUO, like, I feel like I can be both a student and like coinciding with my blackness. The way I think about both power and privilege at play is that when we reckon with it, we can sort of expand the conversation that we're having about, about a particular subject matter. If we sort of make sure that there are only a certain group of people um, that are contributing to those conversations, then progress is slowed. And the argument itself, rather than expanding, I think it actually eventually starts to shrink. I'm like not really talking about like too much of like my blackness, but I'm like making it show so that other black voices are being heard. Try, try to work with things I have control over us and being like in positions of power like through ASUO. 
We've had like black student groups come in request for a certain amount of money. I'm always keeping in mind like all of the effort that they like made to be successful within their organization and just the lack of resources that are provided for them in comparison to some like other student groups. It's, I think, really important to understand that argument is something that we use to not just argue with one another, but to actually produce uh, truth and to, to arrive at some sense of what's actually happening. A lot of students come into their first year in college thinking they know what an argument essay is or what a persuasive essay is, and they want to immediately jump into, well, my opinion is, or my stance on this issue is X. In the class, we're really working with students to put pause on that impulse to immediately come to a claim and start to do some investigating, questioning beforehand, doing some reading, really understanding the multiple perspectives on an issue. The goal is to think about how that process of coming to a claim can then be transferred out of a writing classroom into other situations. In any world that the human non-human divide exists in the first place, that is going to re-entrench itself and colonialism will still exist no matter what. There's a large body of research about how argument helps people learn. And among the factors it comes down to is the forcing people to consider, adopt, and explore perspectives that are maybe not their own. Debate has really shaped who I am as a student. It has taught me how to formulate an argument and how to do research to support an argument. They have to defend propositions they don't agree with. They may view this way about an important policy issue, but they must defend the other side for the purposes of the debate. And it's also taught me to look at everything from both sides and be able to make arguments for any claim that I want to support. And the research shows that that's really educational. It causes people to better understand their own point of view. It causes them to better understand the points of view of those opposed to their point of view. And in that mix, they learn more about the issues and oftentimes they come to a greater ability to find areas of agreement or commonality in civic dialogue as an outcome of a competitive process. And more generally, it's just given me a confidence in my academic ability that allows me to do well in school. So there is a disconnect between the academic essay and what is on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or any of those spaces where people are actually engaging in argument in public discourse. So many people will start arguments on social media and then not realize what they're actually saying and they don't consider what everyone else is saying in response. Yeah. And then it just backtrack, like, mm -hmm. I need to take this off. Or they'll just keep going on with that same conversation, trying to make that exact same point. Yeah, they don't try to have a different Yeah. Thing. Like, you need to be able exactly. to say, okay, I guess I see what you're saying, but it's almost like a rebuttal. And I feel like the counter argument has just completely it's disappeared. Gone. But it's because it's social, you know? Well, you're not like planning out an entire essay either. You're just like, I'm gonna respond to that. You read like the first sentence and you're just like, oh, well, I have something to say about that. Arguing on social media is very risky. Arguments by their nature need to be nuanced, they need room to breathe, they need room to bring in diverse viewpoints and ideas in order to achieve any kind of consensus. And social media doesn't allow for any of that. I think social media encourages people to adopt positions too early, prior to critical thinking, prior to the establishment of a logical argument, because it's so binary. I like this post or I don't like this post. Immediately attaches an individual to a frame of mind or a perspective or a thought or a position or a side. I see a lot of students come into these large classes ready to explain who they are, explain their perspectives, explain their own take on things and to almost, almost come in with a, a hat that has their perspectives on that hat kind of thing. And I, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it's just really loud. That takes a lot of energy. I've seen that play out 
a ton on Facebook with my friends and then their like older relatives. And she always gets really engaged and really yeah. invested in these arguments on Facebook. And sometimes I read it and just by association I'm exhausted. And right. I think that has affected how I am willing to engage with people on social media. Right, and because it's all when about I see the medium. That, because if you're texting, I think it's better because then it's like you're emptying all your thoughts, but you're emptying them to an audience of one. It's right. not performative. Yeah, it's so they don't you. care for that. Like, take it off of social media. Argue about it, you know, through texting or messaging. Right, or something and, like and that. I think Quite that's the problem. That's the problem with like social media arguing is that you're not really arguing with a person. You're just making your points to like the people who you think will like that. Right. Right. And to solidify your and social media persona. If we're not exposed to difference, then we aren't required to think. I think that's part of what argument for me too is about being made uncomfortable in a way that makes me question, why do I believe this? Why am I so attached to this view? And those ideas, that ideology, is very central to everyone's idea of themselves in America, who grows up American. Self-criticism is extremely important because it's going to be impossible to be honest and open with your fellow human beings if you can't be honest with yourself. Not, not just scholars or historians or academics. Human beings have a, a huge desire to be right about our views and perspectives. But those of us who are mature enough are aware that it's not possible to always be right. Putting the cap on you use a little bit of gel. Every single experiment is sort of a little bit wrong. Nothing is absolutely correct. And so that's why we really need a lot of experiments to kind of converge on an idea before we can start to believe it. I always try to remind my students that we do the best we can, but don't beat yourself up if you feel like you're not quite sure if the technique you used is the best or the analysis approach is the best. We're not in this alone. We're really working together to try to figure out what the, what the right answer is. It's hard to get students to, to feel less personal with their own opinions. And I catch this with myself too. I mean, I have an opinion on lots of things, and it's hard for me to kind of tone my personal stake in those opinions down so that I can sort of be softer and, and listen to maybe other perspectives, or even listen to other perspectives in my own head. This is in my own head. Or in my head. Folks often think that argument is a kind of abstract event, something that happens in the realm of the mind. But in fact, our arguments, like it or not, are tied to our embodiment, to how we see the world, how we operate in the world. Things are up and down, things move left and right, time works in a certain way, we can see a certain range of colors and so forth. All of those things are fundamental to the way we structure our interactions in the context of argument. If we forget that, it becomes very hard to have productive arguments. Thinking about the role of embodiment in argument, um, one of the most interesting approaches to this is Mark Johnson's metaphor theory, and you really should talk with him. Hello. Hi, I'm in the middle of this interview. On, okay, I'll talk to you later, bye. <laughs> Okay, the old view was there's reason and there's emotion. Emotion's tied to the body and reason is, a, is tied to mind and body and mind are separate. Well, we found that that's just plain false. There's not disembodied, unemotional reason. All over the world, in cultures all over the world, Almost all of our abstract concepts, our concepts for mind, for freedom, 
for love tend all to be defined by metaphors. They are not straight literal concepts like knowing. Could you shed some more light on that argument? Or testing an idea such as what they said left a sour taste in my mouth. <laughs> Raw facts and warmed over theories. We understand ideas as food. So then it becomes an empirical question. Do other cultures have the same metaphors that you have? <laughs> Do you have to have like, a sour taste in mouth? Like in Thai? In Thai? <laughs> um, yeah, but it's kind of like have total, totally different meaning here. Okay. In Thai, we say when I want to have something, I, when I want to eat something so badly, mm -hmm. yeah, that means I would say like for, for that thing. So like you're craving for it mm -hmm. because we have a lot of um, Thai fruit that is sour mm -hmm. and sour fruit are so good. Yeah, so sour taste is, you know, has, has some positive meaning. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what we do, we say, we compare it with the, with bitter. We don't say sour, but we say bitter. Ah, like, yeah. Mera kadwa ho gaya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, uski mm -hmm. baato se mera kadwa ho gaya. That her talk just made my mouth bitter. It's not sour. Sour is related to something that okay. is like <laughs> delicious to your stomach. Yes, mm -hmm. right. All these conceptual metaphors will draw on aspects of our body. This is a way of saying that reason and thought are grounded in our bodily engagement and the very way our bodies can experience things. And that's why we have the metaphors we do. So when you're arguing, you're actually setting up metaphorical frames you argue within. The rare occasion when sports and politics collide at an NFL quarterback has certainly ignited a firestorm. I mean, ultimately, it's to bring awareness and make people, you know, realize what's really going on in this country. You know, this country stands for freedom, liberty, justice for all. And it's not happening for all right now. We believe uh, everyone should stand for the national anthem. That's an important part of our policy. Uh, it's also an important part of our game that we all uh, take great pride in. And it's also uh, important for us to honor our flag and to our country, and we think our fans expect us to do that. So the way we frame a problem will go a long way into the types of solutions that are available to us. If we use the NFL as an example with the anthem controversy, they frame the problem essentially as you're either patriotic or unpatriotic. Anyone who's on the field and is disrespectful to the anthem or the flag, uh, there would be a fine from the league against the team. If they're trying to really solve the issue around anthem protests, they need to think about who are the stakeholders that need to be at the table. You don't even include your players in this. The NBA has a rule that you stand for the anthem. Why is it the NBA has never had a problem other than Mahmoud abdul Rauf, and he paid a price for it, with players not standing for the anthem. The NBA, on the other hand, is taking a process-oriented approach, and they want to engage the players as key stakeholders. When it comes to political disagreements, I would hope that we, the league, together with our players, can play a constructive role. They frame it very broadly. They allow the framing to be a shared exercise between the owners who have some authority and power and the players who have authority and power, but often less. And they're engaging key stakeholders, sponsors, businesses, arenas. Everyone's part of their solution set. As Coach Popovich said the other day, people need to engage and have these discussions and they're not always easy discussions to have. There has to be an uncomfortable element in the discourse for anything to change. Colin Kaepernick has put millions of dollars and challenged other celebrities to put millions of dollars into the neighborhoods. He's right. not just talking the walk, he's walking the walk. Why can't that we, be we should be, Why don't we talk about that? I would love to talk about it, but here's the thing. Oftentimes, that's the challenge with issues we deal with in planning and public policy. A, a typical problem might be a, a proposal for a dam, and it's framed as there's a, a dam or no dam, and so you have a debate and deliberation. The problem is that that leaves very few options. At the one end of the spectrum, you've got a dam. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got no dam. 
in between you've got smaller dam with something else in place. And so the, the challenge is that that really may not be getting at why do you want the dam. And so it may be because of flood control, recreation, irrigation water. But if it's framed as an either or, then you've got no room to really collaborate and discuss those, those options. If you come at it from a broader framing of what is the underlying problem we're trying to solve, it's flood control, then you have a whole bunch of other options on the table. Unless you can get a shared frame, you're not gonna be successful in arguing because the values and the concepts embedded in the frame will determine the terms of your conversation. You certainly have to be aware of the audience that you're addressing their values. There are certain things that cannot be argued because audiences cannot find that point of shared value and shared assumptions. Empathy reminds us to listen and to engage the person on his or her own terms. And it's an incredibly important practice skill for lawyers and for everybody. If you don't have empathy, you're unable to even know if you're talking about the same thing when you're in argument. And that's actually a really common argument problem. People arguing past each other about different matters because they're not listening. We've lost the art of, of listening and being informed and being open to other perspectives and other, um, other views. And to uh, understand how what you say impacts somebody else, and then to be able to say back to them how what they are saying impacts you. It's also a lot easier for a, another person to hear that you're upset with them if you say, what you did here has made the situation difficult, and what I did contributed as well. If you don't address the emotional components, you will never resolve the dispute, because that emotion is what is making the person feel the injustice, and so it has to be dealt with in a sensible and um, compassionate way. When we're arguing back and forth, there's a point where the emotional character of the situation transforms from one that's still up in the air to one that's settled, and then you take action. Let's get a counterpoint. Go ahead. This is, for, and by the way, first of all, with everything that's going on in this country right now, I like how this conversation's going. You be well, reasonable, we, we, we you're making your points, and I like it. Van, continue. As Aristotle says, you don't want to argue with everyone. Argument is a special activity. I really want to be able to throw a wrench into this whole um, notion of argumentation as proving a point. I think a lot of the arguments that are floating out there on the, the internet that seem to be so combative and so unresolvable are because the two different groups are unable to find any sort of shared shared ground. I think the idea in education is more about students coming in, even professors coming into a classroom, ready to try on different perspectives, ready to practice perspectives. What if we had the view that, an, that creating an argument is creating a collaborative work of art. That would be a very different way then of going about. Instead of having this conflict, argument is conflict, and you're gonna beat the other, the opponent, you know, and be triumphant. It would be a more collaborative activity where you create something new that reveals some new understanding or meaning. No matter what our differences are, we actually need each other. Liberals need conservatives. White people need black people. Men need women in order to get to where we're going. And so when I think about even in conversations with family members, um, how do I try to go to something that maybe is out of my comfort zone um, as a way to begin to think about why do they think that this is the, the way that this question should be addressed? A real argument is something where you actually don't know how it's gonna come out. 
but rather you want to engage in a process with the person you're arguing with in order to realize some result that's not yet determined. Argument is really important. It helps, helps us to shape our, our reality, helps us negotiate our reality, um, helps us to, to negotiate our values, it helps us to understand the world, and it helps us to understand ourselves.